Good evening. Thank you for coming here in such bad uh, weathers. Tonight, we are hosting a very special speaker and a very interesting conversation. This event is taking place as part of two projects at the same time. This is a festival of uh, uh, the Tetramatica Festival, and the second uh, project is the unnamed exhibition taking place in the Center for Urban History which is the artistic reflection of Nikita Kardan and a historical reflection of many researchers on contested uh, subjects of the Second World War and mass killings. We are extremely happy to be talking tonight uh, about these issues with a well-known Polish artist who works with these topics. Among others, I'm not going to extend uh, too many details, and Miroslav Balka does not really require the introduction. He is a famous Polish artist and one of those who are shaping the modern art, the contemporary art, as it is today. His works and pieces are displayed in all of the largest modern art museums. And this is the artist who is deeply reflective and the topics he deals with and addresses are very interesting. This is the heritage of the avant-garde art and there will be the exhibition in a national museum on that. And the second topic is uh, the individual trauma and the memory and uh, memory and commemoration in the present day society. We're going to discuss this tonight and we're going to have two parts. Miroslav Balka will start with presenting his projects and then we will have Lizaveta Herman, an independent curator with her own projects to moderate this talk. She is also reflecting on the subjects we are going to bring forward tonight. Both they and us are going to have a discussion about the modern art about the contemporary art and about the past. Uh, thank you so much for coming here and the floor goes to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. It's very nice to be here. We are having a good time so far. This morning we started the workshop with the young artist from Lviv. And as this workshop is related with very young artists, I would like to, uh, I prepare this presentation, which will start from the very beginning of my artistic activity, which will start from the time when I made diploma in Academy of Fine Arts in 1985. I studied for five years in Warsaw Academy in the sculpture department, uh, but for the diploma work we found the abandoned house uh, near Warsaw and it was the first time we, when the professors uh, moved out of the building of academy to, to visit the place where diploma of the student graduated diploma was presented. So it was a house where nobody lived, about 30 kilometers from Warsaw. We brought the commission in the bus with the help of the young uh, local boys. We, we make the ceremony of the opening. And the sculpture which I brought to the house was the figure of the boy and the title of his work was Remembrance of the First Holy Communion. And it was made in uh, concrete with the use of different colors, but the colors were made in natural way. So when the legs of boy were a little bit uh, pink, the color was made with the mixing concrete and crushed red brick. And for example, when something was white, it was crushed marble. So in some way, in this technique, we use the 
materials which are thrown away, like for example the dust of the marble, the dust of the brick. So the brick was used for building the house. The marble, usually, the dust of marble is the result of making something, uh, something uh, which is strong and three-dimensional, like sculpture in marble, for example. This presentation in the in the suburbs of Warsaw was very shocking uh, at the end for the commission because uh, actually being in the situation out of the building of the academy the professors were completely they didn't know where where they are so they didn't know how to deal with the situation because they felt safe only in the building of academy and this was a lesson for me very important lesson, maybe more important than five years of education in this academy, that, that I, have, I should look, but the choice of the place is very important for the artist, the place of presentation, and that this place, if it's possible, should be a real place. Because when you touch the different, different links, different subjects in, the, in your work, actually, just after this one day presentation, I had to bring the sculpture back to the building of academy and uh, the work was presented there. Just a brief history of my art, but it, uh, I cannot do it longer, but the presentation will stay next uh, 23 minutes. But uh, once I sculpted in very figurative way in academy, after leaving it, I started the construction of the figure. So this is the sculpture called Fireplace. And uh, it, at, uh, it was made, as you see, the figure slowly is disappearing. And uh, it was a construction of the bricks covered with the newspaper. The carpet was and it was placed on the real carpet, and the carpet was turned upside down. So it was like the situation which is under the carpet. So, uh, and it was the electric bulb uh, and the concrete shoes, and it was called Fireplace, and it's in the collection of the Tate in London. That's how it looks there. And as you can see, the, the, the walls of the bricks are covered with the paper, and this paper are the pages of obituaries from the local newspaper, depending on the place where it is presented. Every time the newspapers, this information about the death from the local newspa newspaper has to be changed. And another figure from the, the end of the 80s, it's in my studio at that time, which was very small and very simple, very modest, and this is the sculpture figure called uh, The River, and uh, in the sculpture for the first time I used the pies of ashes, as you can see on the left side, and the neon tubes uh, and the Figure and it was presented in a small gallery, Labyrinth 2, in Lublin. And actually, I'm mentioning this because uh, this place in the different building is run by Valdemar Tatarczuk, who is the curator of this exhibition mentioned, which will take place in next week. And the figure called River had the neon tubes on its back. But what was important for me, that, that this situation was in the basement of the exhibition space and on the, on the top of this exhibition space it was a kind of the coffin in the shape of, of this swimming figure. So you could place this, I mean, it was smaller, so you couldn't place this figure, but it was in the relation to this swimming figure, but it was a coffin with, with the place for the hand, and it was above the sculpture. And probably this was the first step 
when after making this figurative uh, gestures since 1985 uh, till 1989 when this exhibition took place. So this was the first step when into losing the figure and into when the body of the figure, figurative sculpture, was taken by the coffin, for example. And, uh, yeah. This is a drawing from that time explaining this, what I told you. And then I could spend many hours to explaining you the different materials which I'm using, different work, different realizations, because since 1990, uh, when I exhibited in Aperto, in Venice, uh, I'm exhibiting uh, in many, many places all over the world. But, but I would like just to show you some materials which I'm using. Uh, in the context of the special interventions. And one of this material is soap. And uh, soap which I'm using is, uh, is put on the walls. And uh, usually it's of my height. And uh, the idea of using the soap is that uh, actually soap is one of the first public product which we meet in our lives. So when the body is born, it's, as a baby, it's washed, it has, has contact with the soap, and when the body is disappearing, the life, uh, it's also, the dead body is also washed with the piece of soap. So in some way, the soap is a kind of the parenthesis of our life. And, and in some way, what attracted me it was this relation of the soap and the corridor. And the corridor is also like the space in between. The space between uh, something which we don't, like in the metaphorical way, we could say that, that our lives are like the corridors. Because uh, we come from nowhere, from darkness, which we hardly know where where are we rooted, and then we disappear in something which we don't know. So actually, we only know the space of the corridor, but we know that we are only in between somewhere, but we don't know where from we came, and we don't know where we will go. So, the, like the, in the architecture also, the corridor is the space between spaces, so it has no function of living room or bathroom or whatever, it's just the space leading you or connecting something. But I think that uh, the importance of using of the corridors comes from this, what I told you before. Uh, and also the soap, I, I make the works using the soaps uh, which are used. And inspiration to doing this came from, uh, from activity of my grandmother, who was from the generation uh, who survived the war and hard times. And this generation was also the generation of my parents. This was the generation when, which in a very natural way was recycling the products. So it was uh, never throwing away, being not educated in this matter as we are now selecting the garbage. At that time, the people did it in very natural way was just normal. So she collected uh, the pieces of soaps uh, for later eventual use. So actually she didn't use it, but she collected these pieces, so never throw it away. And I made few sculptures using these materials in the simple way, just putting, drilling the holes in them and uh, putting them in the on the thin steel ropes and uh, in there are different uh, in different ways they are displayed the longest one it's about 12 meters and it's in the collection at the Tate in London 
and in this uh, works, what interested me is this personal touch, because each of these pieces of soap was touched, so it's not anonymous any longer, and it's carrying the, the memory of the person who touched the soap. So, also, in some way, this is the work made of the works by many, many sculptors, because everybody using the piece of soap in everyday life, even not being conscious, is making kind of the sculpture. It's very domestic dimension, but, but if we know or if we don't know, but we are making sculptures if we are using the bar of soaps, and we do do it with our body. So this is very basic gestures of doing something, and this is what we do. Well, we are working on the field of disappearing, so the soap is disappearing, and uh, and it's because of us, because we are using it. So each of the soap was very personal in some way. Another material in this related with this uh, this function of disappearing was the chain of the obituaries, the obituaries which I mentioned before in this work Fireplace. Here are they used in a different way. I make the workshop first with the friends and then with the other people. First of all I, I collected the pages of obituaries in the newspapers and uh, I'm the one who is reading the obituaries. Uh, I did it 20 years ago, I did it 10 years ago, I do it now. And uh, I think that most of the young people don't do it because this is, our words, uh, eliminates the paper and the obituary mostly is presented on the last pages of the newspapers. So, so we made the chain uh, uh, which consists of the using the very simple glue, like the flower glue. Uh, and then the chain was hanged in the space. But, uh, so in the first view, when you enter to the space, because it looked like the kind of the cheap decoration for the Christmas or for the school party or whatever, but when you started to read the, the text information, in the, when you start to zoom this work, then you notice that what, what what are these pieces of paper are about, and they are about disappearing, about dying, and uh, what happened here was the new neighborhood of the people who, like the people who meet for the first time on the last pages of newspapers, on the pages with obituaries, they never meet before, and it's also very often happened in the graveyards when people who don't know each other finally they spend the last of their after death life in their ne neighborhood in some way. So this is a new relation of the people. And actually it was quite interesting, it was very popular work. We made it in a couple of places uh, in different parts uh, of Europe and in states as well. But what was always important was uh, in for this workshop I only gave the idea how to do it but uh, I decided the dimension of the chain of the single chain but then it was made by uh, we ask always the young people and for them it was very often the first experience with something like the obituary and because I mean nobody think about death being young but uh, this was quite interesting for them to do it Oh, sorry. <coughs> and uh, this chain was presented in the gallery, but in the front of the gallery I asked the young performers from the circus and they were doing these flames out of their mouths, because actually it was the holiday of the West, uh, 
Ash Wednesday. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this day, but no. this is the day when you, in the Catholic tradition, you are obligated to go to the church to get some ash on your head, just to remember about that. And so the, in the gallery was this chain of the paper, very fragile, for the very easy material to burn, because also the fragility of the newspaper paper was important for me. And the title of this exhibition, as you can see, was Shah. And uh, Shah is just like a short word when you want to say Chisha. When, when the word Chisha is too long, you just say Shah. And in every country, we've been looking for this uh, short version of sh. It was always something related with sh, sh, sh. And this was the exhibition of sh. Since 1995, I also decided to, to make the video works. And it came uh, in the time when the, when the video camera started to be relatively small, so you can hide it in the pocket. So for me, it was important that I've been able to be in some way hidden, hidden uh, in the public space, but I didn't display the big camera with me. But I had, I could it, I could do it in the district, uh, this district, discreet, discreet way. And uh, in some way, having the camera with me, I have a, the new kind of the notebook with with me, and uh, I could. And when I started my pilgrimages to the places related with Holocaust, to the old uh, concentration and death camps, and one one of the visits took place uh, in uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. And when I decided to go on the winter day to go there with my camera and finally in an unexpected way I found the, this little deers being there and I've been very nervous, my hand was shaking a little bit but because I didn't expect this animals there behind the barbed wire as you can see and uh, Winterreise was related in some way with the with Schubert songs Winterreise, which are about death, which are about being lonely. And but my Winterreise trip was to Auschwitz Birkenau, and the title of this work is uh, Bambi Winterreise. And Bambi, maybe you should know, but Bambi was the movie by Walt Disney, but made in 1942. So when in Europe uh, people were killed in the mass way, uh, in America people were crying, uh, feeling uh, sorry for the small Bambi losing the mother. So the title of this was Bambi, 19, and this was related with Walt Disney, 1942 um, film. Another work related with the space and the memory was, uh, was made in uh, Krakow, in Poland. And uh, it was a tunnel made of concrete 
with the where in the ceiling I cut the two words with written as a one word and these words were Auschwitz and Wieliczka. And Auschwitz, as you know, is, is death and concentration camp in the south of Poland. And Wieliczka is the beautiful salt mine near Krakow. So very often uh, the tourists are uh, offered to make this one day trip to both places, to the beautiful old uh, salt mine and the dark place of Auschwitz. So these two words, they exist in the package together. They are related with, uh, so about uh, two completely different kinds of experience, but they are offered as a one experience, one day experience. So that's why I put these words together and having these holes in the ceiling, we could make the kind of the live projection, like the video projection needs light, and this was the projection using the sun rays. And depending on the position of the sun, depending on the, the, the time of the year, the projection can be big in the summer, or projection can be very small at the top of the wall in the winter time. But it's kind of the active projection using the, the natural uh, lighting. And uh, as you see, for some reasons, it was popular place to give the protection from the rain and uh, for people having good time there. And, well, graffiti, it's graffiti. I mean, as long as graffiti, for me, it's not, not artistic, it's fine. By artistic, I mean when it's very well done. <laughs> if it's something like this, when it's a kind of the notebook for the people, for me it's okay, because this is a form of how people express themselves even centuries ago when they took a piece of uh, metal and they were uh, doing, writing their names or something on the bricks of the medieval uh, buildings. Actually, the, the work stands on the way to the Schindler factory, so it's a very popular place, but most of the people who go through, they don't have any idea what it's about, because people are busy and they are not spending time on thinking and stopping, but they have to be on run. But, as you can see, they are happy. Another... Uh, corridor, kind of the passage, uh, was made in a, using the strong ventilators because the air, strong stream of uh, air, was also important material for me. This is the realization made in the museum um, in, in Kunsthalle in Karlsruhe, in Germany. And I was offered as an artist to, to work with the collection and the collection to make intervention in the collection. And the collection is like uh, 12 rooms full of beautiful, very important uh, painting of the German Gothic paintings, late, late Gothic paintings. Uh, for example, the artists like uh, Grinewald, Baldung, beautiful. Uh, beautiful paintings, most of them as the painting from that time related with the body, with the body of Christ, body, naked body, body uh, in pain. And I built the corridor which uh, you had to go through all the rooms of the collections and in each room at the entrance to the each room was a strong ventilator. So when the a visitor was coming to when the visitor was coming to to the room it was a strong stream of the strong air touching the body so in this way being a visitor you could feel that you also have body because on the exhibition the eyes are only one element of experiencing the situation because also 
first we are represented by our physical body, by our the body. Uh, so the body was touched, and you could feel that the paintings related with the body, but you also have the body, and uh, and this body it's touched. Another work related with this experience of uh, experience experience of darkness and the space divided was the work called uh, Above Your Head, and it was a steel mesh dividing the space and hang above the hangs of the visitor. It was made in a white cube uh, in London, and now it's in the collection of Tel Aviv Museum. So it was a huge, huge space, and it was divided in two spaces and one was under this net was available to you what was above was not available was the work uh, in, made in 2009, titled How It Is, and it was in Turbine Hall, in the frame of the Unilever projects there. And the title, How It Is, was related with, uh, with the work by Samuel Beckett, the same title. And this black, it was a black box, as you can see, very big, 30 meters long, 15 meters high. And the walls of this uh, box were covered with the very soft materials, which is a little bit like velvet, but it's called uh, flock. Yes, and so you had experience of the and this material gives you the completely dark interior. So coming to this space, uh, in some way entering there, once you make decision that you want to enter, you could disappear there. But as you could see, maybe from the from the from this short movie people came from the back side, so they didn't know the entrance to the turbine hall was from the back of the sculpture. So they, so entering there, uh, you had experience that you had to walk first 30 meters along this box. So in some way, during this 30 meters walk, you became familiar with this box, and this box you started to know, and then when you came to the front of this piece, then you were confronted with the decision, enter or not enter. And it was, uh, some people didn't want it to enter, some entered. And uh, my friend, uh, 
I mean, unfortunately dead from two years, is Zygmunt Bauman, Professor Zygmunt Bauman. The, uh, when he wrote the text for the catalog for this exhibition, for this project, he wrote that uh, people who are in the darkness, they are becoming closer to themselves than people uh, in the daylight. So in this way, the problems, the darkness generates the energy when you can find the friendship with the others. And in these conditions, it's easier to, to look to the others, however, we don't see them. And just to, to finish, this presentation, because as I promised, it will be half an hour. I just uh, wanted to share with you the part of my uh, pedagogical uh, uh, practice. Uh, as I'm from 12 years, I'm running the studio of the spatial activities. Uh, first in Poznań, then it's in Warsaw. I do my I do the classes with the students and we are doing different experiments with the different spaces, the spaces which are out of the academy. And what I will present it to you now is one of the of our action which was called Pogo and which we made in Zielona Góra in Poland.
the art institution, not for the main uh, entrance, but from the side side. And this is what I recommend to young artists to do it. Thank you. actually managed to chat quite a lot in today, half an hour, <laughs> half an hour period. I hope we can discuss more um, during the second part. Um, also, I want to say that I will be moderating discussion, so I will be given a starting point for, for the conversation, but I hope that you guys in the audience have your own questions, so I can pass the mic to you at a certain point. Um, well, my first question would be maybe kind of general and banal, but, um, well, your practice is very much related to the private experience in relation to a particular time and place and the historical background of your home country, Poland, and uh, um, actually this, this specific private background and the relation to it is an important issue, important topic for many artists uh, who, who were born uh, in the post-war period. And you manage, your, your practice is very much rooted in your personal biography and the country you were born in. But with your project, you, ma you manage to make a universal statement, uh, quite sharp and understandable for people out living outside Poland, living outside Europe, and even those who are not familiar with maybe historical context at all. So the question would be, um, how would you describe this thin, ephemeral line between making a very personal, very specific statement and making a statement accessible for a wider audience, no matter what the background these people have. Well, this is a very it's complicated and very difficult question, because to make the definition of something uh, which is so fragile, you at the beginning you start to crush this fragility in some way. So it, it's not coming from the special uh, strategy or calculations, but it uh, comes from the fact of maybe being honest in uh, doing things. And uh, I think that being honest is one of the things which you can do as an artist. I've never been looking for my global perspective because I cannot have such a perspective. What I see, like here, I see only the people who are in this room. And and I, my space is described by the dimension of the room. So this is my, these are my possibilities, for example, of seeing and un, and trying to analyzing. So I always try to to analyze the fragments, you know, and even sometimes it can, can be the fragment of one millimeter by one millimeter. But this is also the analyze, like the drop of the tears, for example. And uh, so I've never been looking for global. That's why maybe in this gesture uh, of being honest, uh, plus of course some artistic practice, etc. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but probably that's why. So the honesty would be the universal language which can kind of knock the door different kind of audience. Yeah, I mean, believing in the in the real gestures, you know, as for example, like when I showed this video, when my hand is shaking, uh, when I make the video, I'm not trying to to make it uh, better on the working with this, what I did, or I, I don't make montage to these gestures. They are rather based, based on the on the simple, simple thing, and uh, they, they don't forget that uh, artist is also human being, you know. So I never, I never, I never do my art from the position of high and uh, from the hierarchic position. But after so many years being in such a having the works in the most important museums in the world, I I mean something more. I still mean nothing from the position of the history of of the world, you know. If we talk about the collapse of the 
Roman, Roman Empire, if we talk about the importance of the Egypt, our, we are just dust. But having this consciousness of the dust, for me, it's very good uh, fuel for my activity. I don't, uh, I don't feel bad that I am dust, just dust. So it's okay with me. Um, I love the way how you describe these special conditions we are now situated in. And uh, for those who saw your presentation right just recently, it's clear that the issue of body and the special, uh, special experience is one of the most crucial points to your practice. And um, I've been thinking that you, you've been gradually moving from direct representation of the body, like more or less realistic, to representing the um, the things, the forms that accompany the body, like coffin, like bed, uh, uh, some attributes in relation to the body, and also so, um, and then to more special, spa special um, installations, bodiless. I mean, without actually representing bodies, something which underlines the absence of the body, and the body becomes the viewer. So most of your recent installations can be activated only. Uh, with the presence of, of the body. And, um, uh, but also, I've been thinking that since you started your practice, the, the notion of corporeality changed a lot, because a big part of the social activity uh, or, and of the human life moved to bodiless sphere, which is internet, which is social media. So people really um, leave a big part of their lives without actually interacting with the bodies of each other. So how do you think the question would be, how do you think the perception of your works <coughs> might change with this change of corporeality? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, since, since mid-80s, I mean, many, many, many things have changed in the world, yeah? As you said, when I did this figurative works, it was a completely different time, so... Nowadays, you can have the figurative sculpture made by the 3D printer in some way, but uh, or you can have. Uh, but but uh, I think that uh, but there is a beside of the fact that more and more people, especially younger generation, but also my generation. We spend more and, more, more and more time in front of the computer, so we are <coughs> some, in some way having more, we are limited the possibilities of the direct perception of the world in this, including the different senses. However, the people are working on, on intensively on including the, all the senses into the, also into this. Uh, uh, computer world, but uh, I think that there is a need uh, which I see among represented by my students, for example, who really wants to join my studio. And uh, the concept of the studio is the studio of the spatial activities, and we are working on very unplugged way. So. Um, so I think that there is a need of the direct contact and uh, simple performative gestures, very basic things. So, so I think that, uh, however, we use the, soon we will be able to, 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 to light the cigarettes with our iPhones, but I think that, uh, the need of uh, our, our iPhones will smoke our cigarettes. <laughs> but I think that the need for the box of matches is still uh, present, even for the younger generation. Um, um, also, just, just to continue the, this issue of body experience, um, I've seen just, I mean, I must confess, I've seen just a few of your pieces like in reality, I am mostly familiar with your work through, through the documentation, through the internet, through the books, of course. Um, and also, during the presentation you, we saw just recently, um, I just couldn't help but thinking that um, your works 
a very, uh, the images we works are very powerful, and despite the fact that many of these projects were made to have live experience, physical experience, the image is still very powerful, and it can it can have almost the same impact through the computer, and um, uh, also because the photographs are nicely done. I mean, I can see that. Thank you. Um, I can see that you are quite. I mean, you the documentation you have is quite quite professionally made. But um, I'm thinking when when you're working over the piece, do you think equally about the direct physical effect of the work and about the effect it will have on the <coughs> image, and the image will last even when the project is done? Yeah, it's a good question, but uh, actually I don't think too much about uh, the image. Some of the images are better, some of them are worse. Trying to make this presentation, I chose the better ones. But I have uh, plenty of very bad photos of my works. And sometimes I'm standing in the front of the photo, which gives me a lot. But then I know that there is no photo which can represent this work. And in the good way, but uh, so this is a little bit problem with my works for me, and because they really need this uh, direct context and direct experience, because they are not they are relating with different senses, which I mentioned before. You know, it's they are related to the movement of the body in the space. You know, the distance between the works, the display in the space is also very important. The smell of the works, you know, the temperature. Because I used to, many works are related with the temperature of the body. So these are the things which you cannot show uh, uh, on the photo. And uh, unfortunately, so far, uh, the photo or video. But I don't know if you will have the time in the future life to watch all the videos which we all human being artists even made in our lives. But I, unfortunately the, the image so far is the only representation of the of, of the of the work of art and uh, I don't know maybe it will change in future but, but I feel a little bit not comfortable with this because my work is not only about the good quality transparency which you can show like for example in, the, in all these commercial galleries which I deal with, with the good ones they make now they show it on the computer but before it was a transparency of the size of the computer which cost a lot it was presented to the client and the client from this photo should know the work but but with my work, it doesn't work so easily. So, and maybe it's a good thing because when I'm being dealing with the commercial world, I'm still because of these difficulties. Uh, they are not so easy going. This is not the photo of work of Anish Kapoor, for example. So maybe this keeps me more active and motivates me more than, than just the satisfaction from the image. Um, also, when you showed the work in Karlsruhe, uh, this installation in the classical museum, inside the classical museum display, I was also thinking about the issue of iconography, because, for example, in the medieval art, in the Gothic art, the, the iconography and the symbolism of different things uh, meant a lot. Like, the, ro the rose was a symbol of that, and the fruit was a symbol of this, and you could read the whole painting through deciphering these images. And with your presentation, they're thinking about some, something something similar. Of course, you can't um, you can't experience the work with the with the soap, for example, without being able to smell it, without being able to feel the the um, the surface of it. Um, but still, your practice um, is also all about iconography, I think, because there is lots of quite readable, I mean, in a good sense, uh, symbols like darkness, like body, like coffin, etc. So, do you think of a certain iconography, or is this, well, is, do you think about your practice as a certain number of symbols important to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, but symbols in the domestic use, I would say, in the practical use, not symbols as symbols. I don't use the symbols like the sea, ocean, 
which, rep which can also represent salt. I'm, I'm closer to the symbols which are on the side of the weakness. So when I say salt, for example, I mean the dry sweat or dry tears, and uh, so which are related with the weakness of human body. So my vocabulary of symbols is much simpler one and much more personal and very often on the side of the, of the weak sides of the human presence in life. But, uh, but I think that each artist is building his own iconography in some way. But uh, also uh, the icono the, the dealing with iconography there is a space for the visitor, yes, who experience the work. And like, you, as you mentioned, uh, the old paintings which you could read uh, from A to Z, from the first uh, left corner to the bottom right corner, you could read them. Uh, I think that not everybody could read them, you know, only educated people, the, the, the one somebody who just went for the mess and uh, didn't have any idea what is the meaning of the nail, what is the meaning of the rose, what is the... Uh, mean, many meanings were completely unknown. And uh, sometimes uh, today also the... for some people the... some iconographic symbols are reliable, but for some not. So it's still not so simple because it, I think the exhibition uh, is like the form of the exchange. That, and what is important in this exchange is also the, the figure and the, in some way the, the fact of uh, presence of the visitor in the space. So I mean, first of all, the visitor shouldn't be in a hurry. <coughs> which is not so easy nowadays to find the time to experience the, the, the show in the quiet way because we are running fast, we want to know everything in five minutes because we are in a hurry. So I think that uh, besides of knowing a little bit iconography, the fact of giving the time to the, for the experience is very important. And uh, I have a feeling that I went somewhere in the fields which I lost the question. It's all related to one another, anyway. <laughs> um, do you actually analyze the, how the public reaction to your works um, <coughs> have been changing? Or is, it, is there any major changes at all, for example, in Poland, if you compare the 90s and nowadays? Do you, that, does the public reaction matter to you? And do you try to analyze what, how your works have been? You know, the, the, biggest, uh, I mean, the biggest field of noticing the reactions of the people could be the, the project made at the Tate uh, Turbine House mm, um, because it was almost one million visitors who experienced this piece because this space of the Tate is for free, <coughs> so people just do it and uh, but then, at the beginning, I started to watch, watch their reactions, but I noticed that it's so many different reactions that, uh, that I'm not, I was not interested any longer in the reaction of the people. I mean, not in the fact that I ignore their reactions, but I think that everybody has the right to his own reaction. If he wants to laugh, it's fine. If he wants to be sad, it's okay. But, but so I think that the, uh, there is a power in the varieties of the reactions, you know, of the people. But so, from the general point of view, but if we say, for example, about the reaction of the visitor for my work in Poland, I mean, it has changed very much because uh, in the nineties, when I beginning at the beginning of my international career, I mean, uh, the reactions was very often. In, in the press, very, very aggressive, you know, very against me. When I represented Poland in 1993 in the Venice Biennial. But why? What was the criticism about? The criticism was, for example, that how can you use such a 
material like the piece of soap, for example, and why you are telling to the people that this is work of art, for example. And the criticism was also, as in one interview I said that, uh, for example, the pieces of soap were collected by my grandmother. And then it was just a question, why you show the pieces of soap used by the <laughs> grandmother? <yes. laughs> so, I mean, now it's funny, but, but it was really serious uh, or something, for example, related with uh, pieces of soap again. Uh, and that this is just like dealing with the subject of uh, Holocaust, not in the serious way, because some of the critics try to tell me that once you are washing hands, you have to think about Holocaust, which I don't know if they do it, but they try to prove that that, that I am having the words with soaps, I am just banal, uh, making the banal way projecting the project, uh, problem of Holocaust. But, but I noticed that, that everything has changed as I got the acceptation, very strong acceptation of the Western world, the critics and uh, institutions, art institutions. And, uh, and so the reactions of the press were uh, started to be very positive. But then after, when I made this big project at the Tate, everything is positive. So, <laughs> so, this, so this is actually very absurd because uh, sometimes, you know, the big institutions, big uh, exhibitions, uh, however, you know, exhibition at Tate was in 2009, but I've been working since 85. So I did quite a lot in this time. And, but, but for people, sometimes the big places means that uh, they, ch you, they change completely their opinion. You know, like, that everybody loves you after you make a good exhibition in a good place, the big. So, so people has changed. Uh, but, uh, but I think that at least at that time, uh, people were fighting for something, you know, even even making the wrong critics, bad critics against me, but they fight, were fighting for the ideas. But when I watch uh, what people write, not about me, but about the other exhibitions, how exhibitions are, how the text about exhibition look like, so I have a feeling that we are losing a little bit the the subject of idea of something. We just read, read these critics are about the forms, and it's hard to find the the values and ideas which can be analyzed. So it's a little bit. But I think it also depends. Uh, it's, maybe it's because of the situation in general. Because actually the ones who write, they write about what they see, what they experience. So I think something has changed. But the idea just in this beginning of the 21st century disappeared from the art world. I mean, it's a time of very postmodernist time. Yes, you can do everything. There is no mainstreams. But it also in this way, we don't have... Uh, the artists uh, don't fight so strong for something which is more than just a personal presence. I remember in the 80s when we were really fighting among each other, this artist discussing the subjects and really we, we wanted to change the world. And I don't know if the younger artists still want to change the world. I hope that yes, but maybe I don't understand, which maybe it's good as being older, I don't understand younger. Maybe this is a progress. <laughs> on a small, change the world, but on a smaller scale, perhaps. <laughs> um, just talking about the, if, if you mentioned the issue of Holocaust, uh, I'm thinking about the, the museums, for example, Holocaust museums, or, or other public memorial institutions and museums, which are 
often blamed or criticized for being too straightforward and too like one-sided one in what they're presenting to the public and also even a bit entertaining, if we can say so, about these type of institutions. And the reason for that, why they act so, is that they just fight for the public, they want to be accessible for mass audience. Mm. And with, with, the, with the art, with art exhibitions, with art projects, uh, which are addressing the same issues, the same painful, complicated issues, but um, making more complicated, more complex statements. And the art practice, in this sense, is also being blamed for being in reverse, being less accessible, being uh, more complicated to understand. Um, so, do you think the art has this capacity of addressing complicated issues and to be accessible for quite a big audience without reducing actually the idea, without being banal, without being entertaining? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, dealing, dealing with Holocaust, we should we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't forget that the Holocaust, however it's represented in the history of human beings by the big numbers, huge numbers, which terrify us, but. Holocaust was about individual uh, tragedy, so it was built of, of, of many millions of little drops of the pain of human beings. So I think that as long as we re will, as we will remember about this individuality, we artists and we people, uh, that we cannot measure Holocaust with the numbers. Uh, we cannot measure Holocaust, uh, but there is a hope for the um, there is a space not to understand, but but to be to feel in this uh, to feel this tragedy in the individual way. I mean, the worst the problem starts when we have the big letters. Uh, cut it like the letters letters uh, on the heels of the Hollywood when we try to display the word Holocaust in the same way when we say Holocaust and it's on the hill and it's sunset and it's, it's Holocaust I think that uh, Holocaust was very often about I mean it was mostly about very private tragedies and, uh, and then we shouldn't forget about it, you know, because the discussion very often goes into the directions that, that it was less, 1,000 less victims or 2,000 more, and discussions goes like this. But I think each single shoe, which is represented uh, in the pile of the shoes in many of the Death camps was belonging to somebody and has individual story, and only in looking for these private stories uh, we can try to understand something. But the word "understand" is not the right word because we will not understand, but at least we will feel sorry for somebody, and this will be enough in some way. Because it's hard to be sorry for one million. Because how to understand the number like one million? Who has seen one million people in his own life? But of course, the difficulties. That's why the good things are, for example, uh, the program of uh, of document collecting the memories of the people who survived the Holocaust. This is what uh, finally when Spielberg gave money for this uh, program to find any survivor, Jewish survivor of Holocaust and to to record him or her. So I think that's a very important uh, important issue for us. As long as these people are alive, we should uh, remember them and then we 
we should collect what they are telling us, because they, they are the witness, you know, I am already post-witness, so I, I'm building my, my witness in a different way, but they are the, still the real ones, for example, month ago, at the first week of uh, September, I opened the exhibition called um, Memory, but written in the opposite way, uh, reverse way. And uh, it was in uh, Windermere, in, uh, near Liverpool, in the Lake District, and there is a place called Lake District Holocaust Project. And uh, this is the place where, in 1945, the group of 200 uh, orphans, Jewish orphans from the middle of Europe was sent to UK to, 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 to start new life. So they were offered <coughs> new possibilities in the country which was not destroyed so, as much as the continental Europe and uh, I I did I made the presentation it was very low budget so I showed just one video one drawing on the wall one old drawing but it looked very fine but what was fantastic thing was that at this opening were three of these boys because they are still called boys However, we said the uh, guys in the, in the 80s, but uh, to see their eyes, how they thank me for making my presentation, it was really something which I uh, I still remember. And actually, I have quite few old friends who who survived the war, and I met them in very unexpected way in my life, but they are still very important persons and uh, I think they are touched by my work and this is very important for me, so I, I feel really, I, it's hard to find the word, you know, good, or, because I prefer not to make these words related with Holocaust and that the Holocaust could never happen, but since it happened, we have to deal with this. So we cannot just, uh, like sometimes people are still bringing the question, uh, the sentence of uh, Adorno, the question of Adorno, shall we make the, the art uh, after Holocaust? And, and this question was related to, personally, to the poet, Paul Celan, and, and I, for me this is not uh, this is not the question, and as it, it was not the question for Paul Celan, you know, as a creative person, you cannot just say, okay, after something like Holocaust, we are we human beings, we artists, we are not allowed to make an artistic creativity, because yes, we artists should do something to manage, to, hold, to help, to, to survive the situation after the Holocaust, because Holocaust was something, but what happened after Holocaust was something else, and it was not just a situation full of uh, flowers and happiness, it was the pain of this big uh, hole which was done in the body of, the, of Europe. So uh, I think that uh, that artists, and I feel also my responsibility, like in this, that, that I should do something. Uh, once some people are still living, the real witness of this, I, I also have the right to do the works related with this subject. And yeah, but dealing with the subject of Holocaust, like uh, like this poet Paul Celan. Uh, first, you have to break language, like he had to break language, just to build the new word, the new vocabulary. So, when you're asking me about this iconography, 
So I think that also what is important is to, if you deal with this subject like this, is to, to break iconography, the old one, and to use the new iconography, which maybe it will be not as smooth, as logic, as the ones which you could know, you could use, but you sh once you build the new connections, new relations between symbols and non-symbols, because non-symbol has the same importance like symbol, like the shadow, it has also sometimes stronger presence than the real body. So, this is a very long sentence, but, but I think you managed. Yeah. So. You mentioned a very important thing that I'd like to stress, the, the artist's responsibility. Um, do you think, I mean, this is a bit an imp improvisation question, but I also need to think about how to put it in the right way. Um, but do you think the artist is responsible for um, saying aloud certain things which are politically important, which are socially important, but which are not uh, verbalized in other in, in other spheres, like in media, for example, or I don't know, in lit well, literature is an art as well, in media, in journalism, in uh, political statements. Do you think the artist is really responsible for not staying silent, but saying, verbalizing certain things. I'm not, I'm not saying verbalizing in direct word, like to make political claims, but to say it through, through the artwork. Yeah, I think, yes, of course, but, uh, you know, there are different kind of people and there are different kind of artists. But uh, I think that, that artists, artists have possibilities of uh, of uh, taking, of working in these areas which are related with politics, uh, but maybe not in such a direct way, because I think if my statement would be 100% uh, political, so why, sh so that means that I should stay politician and I should change, uh, I should change my place of my presence, then I should be fighting for being the member of parliament and do something for people on this field if I if I declare totally strong political statement. I, I'm always on the side of the poetry and this, the words which are which needs a special glow to 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 glue them together to make the sense. So some artists do stronger statements, and it's fine, but I am not the one who does it. I prefer to talk with the others uh, using the kind of the poetry, not, not the prose. You know. However, doing the poetry also you can talk about responsibility, as Paul Celan did, and I think he did a lot on this field using his poetic language. He make maybe more than some other politicians of uh, rebuilding the Europe after 1945. Because the responsibility of the culture, I think it's a little bit different than the uh, responsibility of uh, politics. However, today we try to say that yes, artists can do everything, can be active on every every level of our lives, social, politics, but I, I, I'm not so sure, because I think that uh, if, if you really want to be strong on the, on the politic field of the political statement, you should stay politician, you know, and if this is artistic project, it's fine, but... Maybe it's a good moment also to thank you to the to the audience if if any if you have questions. If you have any questions, we can switch the dialogue to a more political format. Do you have any questions? If you don't mind, I will because I, I'm just thinking that I have more questions, of course, but I think maybe yeah, this is a good, good, good is a good moment here yeah, to share the conversation with, with the audience.
Hi, um, thank you for your very interesting conversation. You know, your every answer uh, got a new, brought in new questions for me, and every time when you answered the questions, uh, it forced me to ask you one, but I think I will go back to the first, uh, which was connected uh, also with the genocide, and about uh, thinking about it, uh, because uh, in Ukrainian history we have also uh, uh, the moment uh, of uh, thinking about collective trauma, about uh, uh, Holdemar, and uh, now uh, it seems that uh, the society still doesn't have uh, uh, a certain language to speak about this. And uh, it seems uh, that um, art is uh, like this fair uh, that can help to build this language and uh, to build the uh, to give a new space to think about it, not uh, by the, the language of uh, our words, but with the language of our, uh, I don't know, perception and uh, expression of our minds. So uh, that's how we are uh, going back to the responsibility of artists, how they need to stay away from building some certain narratives and uh, trying to put some idea into the head of the audience or their role is just to create the space where everybody can uh, reflect. It was a good statement, but where is the question? The question is about um, the role of the artist in the modern world. Uh, I mean, when he was working in, with such a difficult question, uh, do you think that his role is uh, just to give the opportunity for the audience to think about this, or he uh, also need to participate into showing his own position? I mean, it's hard to separate these things because uh, I think that both it would be the ideal, but uh, but not every artist uh, is able to to be present, let's say, in such a, in, in the, some of the artists like to be hidden behind the work of art, and I think that it's still okay, because not everybody has the predispositions to be present uh, in the other way than just work of art, and uh, I mean, for me, this responsibility also, for example, I feel the responsibility as a teacher, for example, and I try to separate uh, in some way what I do in the field of art, in the art art, and however education is also the creative process, but for example I try to not to project my art on my students. What I do, I rather share myself as a citizen of my country, uh, experienced one, but not so, for example, I don't use my work of art in educating my students. I'm trying to work out something else. So I think that not always, uh, this is this, that's hard to give direct answer and one answer, because I think it's many answers for your questions. But I think what is important like working with important subject, uh, it's always the time. For example, in Poland, I'm, I'm not saying that before 1989, artists were dealing with the softer subject or something like this, but uh, what is important, I think, in, in being artist is also self-education. But the artist has to educate, uh, has also should look for education for himself. And for us in Poland, such an important moment of education was the, the year 1989, the first, I mean, half democratic, uh, but, but better than not democratic uh, election. And it was the time when uh, hidden pages of the history, for example, the history related with Holocaust and genocide, could be shown to the people. First in very slow way, but step by step, we could start discussion about the Holocaust. 
that the, that the Holocaust, it was not only the problem between uh, Jewish people and, and Nazis and Germans in the Nazis' uniform, but it was also, we should also look at the Holocaust from the perspective of the places where it took happen and how the local people, if they wanted or not, they've been involved in the process of Holocaust. And it was not easy part of the history. And for some, but it took time to open these pages of these books, which were hidden books. And, uh, and opening these books also, it meant education, for, for, for example, for me, artists, because I started to collect the knowledge informations which before I didn't know. I didn't know that the next street from the studio of uh, where I have a studio and where it was the house where I grew up in the city of Otvotsk, 27 kilometers southeast from Warsaw, that the next street to, to my street was a border of the ghetto in 1942 in Otvotsk. I didn't know the number that 8,000 of uh, Jewish people on one day in 1942 were sent to Treblinka death camp because nobody told me in the school. So actually, we had uh, big holes in the education also. So, but at least after 1989, if somebody wanted, some could repair this hole and. I, as an artist, I, I found it very important for me. And probably also it was a time when I put more attention to the subject of the memory of Holocaust in some way. Uh, yes, I mean... I, and I hope that, that uh, I don't know how is the situation here, but it's always not easy, you know. It was always not easy. But, and many politicians don't want to the subject to be present. They prefer to see the history only in this white and black colors, you know. And actually, the the history of of the world is always in the it's built of the different shades of gray. There's, there is no black and or white, you know. There is something. There is all, everything is mixed. So it were good poles and there were bad poles, you know. Well, like good Ukrainians and, and bad, you know, so it's, uh, but at least knowing as much as possible facts, even if we like them or not, it's good to put them on the table and to not hide them. And, uh, and it's good to remember about this, that the world is not built only, it's not only built of two colors, it's built of thousands of colors. The colors which you like or not? Actually, the problem I think we have now in Ukraine about this official official policy of memory, if to say so, is that there is this black and white situation, uh, which again yeah, shows the the presents the image of a of a good Ukrainian or of the Ukrainian as a victim of this 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 and that, but without showing other side of of different historical moments. And actually, the exhibition of uh, Nikita Gadan, which is happening now in the, um, in the Urban History Center, just you should visit it after the talk or maybe the next day, um, is um, uh, the statement about this, gr well, this great thing that you mentioned, that the situation, that the history is not black and white, that there is actually the other side and we don't know who are the victims, who are the people depicted in this old photographs, for example, and how to treat them. So we can't, I mean, there is nothing we can rely on in making direct judgments and on putting this black and white labels on everything we know. So I, yeah, I would just recommend to, to go and see the, the show, actually. Um, is there any other questions, maybe? Oh, quite, quite many. <laughs> Uh, Virginia, uh, you said that you are interested in, in the weak side of people's existence, so I just wonder why. Uh, well, because I am the weak uh, human creature, and I know that uh, I, 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 
I have a feeling that uh, you can tell more when you talk about uh, the shadow which I mentioned before. The weakness are also the shadow of our presence. And uh, let's see, for me it's more interesting to talk about this subject uh, than about the power of our muscles. Uh, as I prefer whisper than, 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 than shouting and uh, so I think the, in the weakness I find the poetic side of the human being. But, but the weakness is a positive thing, you know, something which you don't feel afraid that you didn't uh, rise up uh, 100 kilograms with your small finger. And that's something which uh, it's easier to share with the other, and it's easier to find the uh, solidarity. And like this is what I mentioned, the figure to, of Zygmunt Bauman, and what he said about these people being united in the darkness when they see less. Together they can see more, and I think that dealing with this weakness, we can be stronger in general. Or weakness, the notion of weakness for you is related with fragility or something like that, or not? Yes. Well, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this conversation and for the presentation. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's uh, allowed in, uh, in this form of um, discussion, but I would like to use a chance of your presence here and ask you to introduce a little bit uh, exhibition, future exhibition in the National Museum. Why you chose uh, to this project uh, your works from 1999 until 2000? As you told, actually, that till that time you were not so like uh, known and uh, didn't have a, a good, uh, not always had a good perception in the society, for example, of Poland and uh, Ukrainian society. Also, uh, in general, maybe uh, is not uh, very well um, aware of uh, your um, artistic activities. So, uh, was it? Um, like intentional the use, uh, um, uh, like cho choosing of this uh, project to this exhibition, and uh, you also said that for you is very important a place in which some <coughs> things are happening and which your artworks are going on. So um, was it also uh, important for you to make this uh, project in the National Museum, Andrei Shuptetsky National Museum, or was it maybe not? Or can you tell a little bit more about this project as I know you won't be present during the opening, if it's possible? Thanks. Well, I think that um, I would like to answer for your question, but uh, when I will start to talk exhibition, which you will have a possibility to see in in few days, it's a little... I don't like the situation like this, because actually everybody has it own imagination and if I start to tell you about the exhibition which you will see in a couple of days then you can be disappointed because you already you, when I start to say the words describing it you will start to build in your head the image and it will be your image it will be not my image because I will be talking about the image by words so I notice that Quite often people are disappointed with something when, you, when we describe something, even not work of art, but places which we visited and finally every, every one of us has his own imagination. So I, I, I prefer not to tell about it. Uh, I can only tell that uh, the title of this is Kain uh, Name, which is title of one of the of the poetry by Paul Celan, who I mentioned today, who in some way his uh, home city is in the in Ukraine.
Ukraine, yes. And so uh, the choice was also in some way, in some way, because I use, I, in the relation with his works, more and more actually. And, uh, you know, when, when we talk about the importance of the places, it's, it's usually artists exhibit in the places which are offered to him. So not always you can make this decision of the space. I, I, it's great to be invited, but also being invited by the institutions, you cannot say, okay, I'm invited by this institution, but I will come to Lviv, and then I will find a place where we make the exhibition because this would be quite complicated. So, uh, when I said about this choosing the institution, and I rather had on mind doing the projects which, which are, let's say, in the collaboration with institution, but where you have the possibility of doing it out of the official space. So that's, that's rather the situation which I had on mind, telling about this. Uh, and uh, the choice of the dates uh, for the show was um, kind of I mean, I'm not looking at the at working on the exhibition, choosing the works. I'm not looking at the dates where works were made. I rather think about structure and the um, relation between the works in the place of being displayed. So. This is my analyze because I spent a lot of time uh, working with the plans of the places where I exhibiting. So analyze of the plans is very important part uh, for my work. So this didn't come from this dates relation, but just by the emotions between the works. Because once I make the solo exhibition, it's always uh, important, the dialogue between the works which I choose. So it's the space between the works is also important as the work by themselves. Because the, 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 this space builds the whole sentence, what is in between, not only this, is because it's not just selections of the different single words. It's the selection of the line which is generated in between. It's more or less about the show. Is there any more questions? Yes. Uh, Miroslav, uh, I like your art very much. I follow your uh, exhibition since uh, 2010. And uh, I'm interested of your point of view about academic education. Is it necessary for a, a contemporary artist to have an uh, academic education. And do you have academic education, uh, like a sculptor, anatomy, composition, knowledge of colors, for example? And um, is it necessary to be a good contemporary artist uh, to have academic education? And the second question, uh, what happened to How It Is project after the uh, closing of the exhibition? Thank you. Thank you for your question. You know, they are the different ways of understanding academic, so it can be good meaning or bad, but if we understand academic as a, as a teaching of the basic things, like uh, drawings <coughs> or the, the rules of using the tools, I think it's good to have this experience, especially on the first year let's say, of studying, or maybe a little bit on the second. Because, I mean, I, I am very traditional in, in, in this. I think it's to make abstract things. I mean, first of all, contemporary artists, I don't understand what does it mean contemporary artists. I would rather say being an artist. Because every artist in his own time was contemporary. And we are just artists. And we think that we are contemporary, but for the next generation we will be not contemporary. But, uh, but for example, like if we look, I always give the, the sample of the, of, the, of the modern music. When 
the composers they composed the composition when they destroyed the composition when they started to deal with the subject of silence like John I'm talking about the grandfathers of the avant-garde music like uh, John Cage for example but John Cage to compose uh, the piece with, with the silence he had to have education with the with the regular music education. So I think that being an artist, I don't have to make a drawing, perfect drawing of the horse or uh, naked model, but I should be able to think with the tool. And I think that the basic education is necessary for this. So I, but not in the I mean, the, the, by academic, I, I, I also can think about something good when you are, because I was, when, when I had this education in school between 1980 and 85, it was just, they teach me how to do something perfect, but not to understand why it has to be like this. So for me, being a teacher is rather, uh, it's rather teaching of, un yes, of understanding of using the tool in the right way. But one of this, you have to go through through the few classic lessons. You know, the composers who made avant-garde music, they were able to play Chopin, they were able to play classic pieces, and and of Beethoven or. So I think there is nothing wrong with this knowledge. But to use it as a ground, I think it's good. But then you can fly. But, but first, I think you need this ground. And it's not about this that somebody... It's not a... But in many, many academies, it's, I think uh, it's, this is understood. The academic teaching means something like just repeating the nature, but finally, I think it's more about understanding the construction of the nature. And if you want to fly, you have to understand the construction of, of the things which surrounds you. So the drawing of a day, because I teach in this media department, and we always have the discussions, what is the teaching of drawing and media department. And, and, uh, and I'm always saying on the statement that that maybe it should be rather the drawing which is related more with the space, more with the architecture, uh, noticing the presence of the human uh, body in the space. So it's, it, it should be changed, of course, but, but I wouldn't... I, I think that some basic things are necessary, you know, and... Uh, this is like cooking the good pasta. I mean, the best pasta is uh, when you use just olive oil and some. And this is a basic thing. You can make, you can be more sophisticated, but you should build your vocabulary. You have to know the letters. You have to know the simple words to deconstruct them. I think. So I'm not saying that <coughs> academic education is good, but I think it's good when the artist. Uh, now knows how to use the tools of, for thinking. And for your second question, I think it's, uh, as, as I'm looking at you, probably you are not the one who is touching my work as it, after the exhibition was, uh, it was, we can say that it was uh, mm, mm, changed into the steel and it was used maybe it was changed into the blades of the razors. Now the concept of this, ex of this project, how it is, was it's always like this, that, uh, because the exhibition is for half of the year in the space and it's site-specific, so we stay on the statement that it's made for this space, because it was made for this space, because I, I analyzed the space of the turbine hole, so that there is no problem that, that the work 
doesn't exist any longer. So it was destroyed and uh, recycled for something, I don't know, maybe car, maybe something else. Uh, actually, I think what, 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 what you've said about the academic uh, education should resonate a lot uh, with lots of people who are present here, you know, just with the Ukrainian audience, because here the academic education is still quite important because this is the quite traditional path which most of the young artists choose and, well, it's lots of artists then build their practice upon deconstructing the academic experience, but um, still most of the artists have it. So. In, yeah, but, I think, but I think it should be like the basic thing. It, it should be, let's say, for the first year, you should have some kind of the basic things. You should know how the the knee is built, what what is the anatomy of the body. You should know these things because they, they are useful. But of course, later you should have the possibility to use them in a completely different way. And. Uh, so I think it's nothing wrong, but of course it cannot be like this, but for the five years of studying you are uh, making better and better uh, sculpture act of the naked body. I think mean, that's this is completely wrong. And uh, yeah. So Okay, I think I think it's been quite a long discussion and I'm very grateful on, on behalf of the Urban History Center, I'm very grateful for such a long and honest <laughs> conversation and uh, um, thank you for, for visiting me. Thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to, to see the body of your works and to talk to you and um, I thank everyone who came here. <laughs> Дуже дякую від імені Центру міської історії. Welcome to the exhibition and welcome to other events as part of the busy program of the Center for Urban History.